But 10 years before the iPhone, we had that. And they were so compelling. Like you go back and watch episodes of The West Wing. They had those phones and they were always smitten with them. They called them crackberries for a reason. which takes me to the last part of, of the sort of, well, the next part of the modernization potential tsunami that may come in the future, which is when we move completely off screens and onto augmented reality. Well, that's the, to me, it's the only thing that can replace the phone. Like the phone is now the dominant computing device, right? It's the primary computing device for the average human. Uh, the biggest thing that the smartphone has done in the past um, 15 years or so since the iPhone really came out and became the de facto consumer device, although it took a few years to do that, is that every, pretty much every adult human in the world now uses one. And we now come to it, you know, every bar argument's been ruined by Google, right? You can't argue in a bar about something. Somebody's invariably going to look it up and now you actually have the answer and where's the fun in that? But also... you got to go I, camping where there's no receptions. You know, yeah, and a Ugandan farmer who doesn't have power to the mains, but he does have a cell phone that charges off solar, and he does have that, is still able to get his weather information, so he's planting at the right time. Like, we have brought this power around the world. You can expect to be able to communicate with anyone anytime and have access to information. We can talk about quality of information. That's a separate problem, right? So what in the world could possibly disrupt that? And the, and the reason I pointed out augmented reality is it's everything the phone can do and more, right? Certainly all of the basic phone services that we, that we now count on, its ability to communicate, to access information, to help us navigate, in many ways the goggles can do that better, right? You've got to think about a navigation, walking around a city where you're literally, what you're looking at is being highlighted and you can move properly. But now we think about what the workflows look like. And I, we, we were just talking about the challenges of building good workflows for mobile devices. Building good workflows for augmented reality are very challenging. And right now, we are seeing commercial implementations of devices like HoloLens, but there's a consistent pattern to them. They tend to be very high price projects, so multi-million dollar projects, because the headsets are expensive and operating them is expensive. And so to me, as an old guy who's done this for a while, it reminds me of what the experience was like with RIM and the BlackBerry in the late 90s. That's when we, first time we got email on phone, it was only for big enterprises because you had to run BlackBerry Enterprise on your own exchange infrastructure to be able to introduce these very expensive phones, typically for your executives, although they became broader reaching. But 10 years before the iPhone, we had that. And they were so compelling. Like you go back and watch episodes of the West Wing. They had those phones and they were always smitten with them. They called them crackberries for a reason. But that idea of an expensive infrastructure with expensive devices for a particular purpose, it's exactly where augmented reality is right now. So now you try to, now you take, recognize that history doesn't repeat itself, it just rhymes. So what's the rhyme, right? It's that the device, the infrastructure gets simpler and cheaper, the device gets less expensive, but you get that compelling experience. Like why did the iPhone win? Right? Why did it revolutionize smartphones for regular consumers? Well, they went to a common form factor, the slab of black glass. Before that, phones were more interesting. But the early designs of the iPhone, which I thought was really impelling because it's gone away now, was the skeuomorphic design. Right? That idea that we created natural textures on the screen that people could relate to, that your books look like they were on a bookshelf, that you had the effect of leather and so forth. I mean, it seems absurd today, but that's because the consumer has changed and wants something more efficient. But in those early days, when this was unfamiliar to the majority of people, that design helped us along. Now, it didn't help you and I. We're geeks. We didn't need it in the first place, but it helped the consumer. And this is where augmented reality hasn't solved that problem yet. Like, these are the pieces that need to be solved. The question is, where does 3D create an, an, an experience that's useful for business? Right? We can see it in the high cost verticals, in the maintenance of technology and in, in these complex interactions. Yes, right? modeling of new technology, that's fine. I'm looking for stuff like ERP, right? like inventory management. And, uh, and being able to understand a business flow in a much deeper way. Like does 3D, can we represent that more effectively? And can we interact in a meaningful way? Can I get to better decisions in less time and communicate those decisions more effectively? 
And I'm not saying I know the answer to that, but I know the shape of those things, and AR has those pieces. And that's gonna be very disruptive for development. Like when we when I ask to talk about like the next 10 years, it's like here's I'm not even gonna say it's a black swan event, like we don't see it coming. Because we do see it coming, but we don't know how we get there just yet, right? We are we are holding a BlackBerry hand in 1998 and trying to guess what the iPhone looks like in 2007. Yeah. You're, you're going to be wrong, but you can guess there will be one. I, I feel like the um, the biggest wins are going to come from real time intervention. So if if you are doing real work, uh, say you're a surgeon, sure, and you're working on a person, uh, and you're wearing an AR interface, and it, and it tells you know it's got the an AI behind it that has a full access to all of human knowledge about you know the heart or whatever. Right. And then something weird happens and some image recognition comes up and says, hey, did you notice this? That's not normal. You should look at that. You know. And you bring up a great point, Ulysses, which is also all of the new AI technology, all the image recognition technologies and machine learning models that we're now having emerging, just being present. The fact that any video that we're looking at is actually going to have this analysis going onto it and catching those things as, they, as necessary. I, th I think that's really powerful, and we still don't grasp all of that potential. They, they, and it's part of a, how I think we're going to address the UX problem with augmented reality is the machine's going to get really good at your reading your face and where you look and how you react, even possibly your body language enough to know what's, in, what's impacting you and what isn't. The biggest thing, I think, when, in consumer AR is that virtual agent we always wished we had. Right? We wanted the phone to do that, but the phone's not good at it because it's often in, the phone, in your pocket when it needed to actually be out in the world. So imagine us negotiating a contract wearing AR glasses so that we literally have a detailed record of us doing that negotiation and the handshake. And that's interesting. The new terms and conditions. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and, but it, but it, with all of it captured, with all of it honest, effectively. This is what actually happened. Um, but we're, we're, we're within a decade of that. But we see all the pieces, you know, Moore's Law continues long enough that we should be able to densify the technology enough to get it be a little lighter and smaller and more yeah. efficient. Apple glasses less, maybe? Less costly. Traditionally, like there's been some mock-ups of what Apple's doing. In some case that Apple's working, but traditionally disruptive products don't come from incumbents. AR might be the exception simply because the cost of the implementation is so very high. Google tried it with Google Glass. Yes. And, 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 I, and I always applaud the experimenters to take it out for a spin. But when it wasn't good, good enough, we made, did make fun of it, right? And the product had to go away. You know, once upon a time, Apple made the Newton, right? In the 1990s as a personal productivity device. And they sold about 50,000 of them and quietly killed it after three years. And 10 years further on, made the iPhone. Just trying to work out whether the market's ready for it or uh, the technology's ready yeah, for it. Yeah, is the technology good enough? Is the experience compelling enough? to overwhelm all of the other issues like cost and appearance and interactivity and so forth. Um, the iPhone, we, I don't think we knew it when we made it, but we learned shortly after that, that the iPhone was good enough. Yeah, so I suppose that'll be less of a, when we do completely change form factors to something like AR, it's not gonna be so much an app modernization as it will be rethinking the whole business process right. of how you deal with a situation and then creating something for the AR space. Well, and I wonder if we won't get a more of a blending anyway. I mean, lots of folks are still struggling to make their apps work well on, on phones anyway, right? And, and we keep presuming that we're gonna, that the devices we build stuff on are the devices people are gonna use on it. We just tend to be more and more wrong about that. Uh, and we're still overcoming those issues. Is there going to be a better blending and intersection on that? Probably, I think one of the things that's gonna be a challenge for AR is you can't make the interface so different that people don't know how to use it and nobody knows how to code for it either. So maybe we will come up with a better pointing solution and a better keyboard solution that keeps the lines a little closer together so it's less of a leap than it is right now. We just haven't got it yet, but working on it. And I suppose you, for business apps, you might still have the same back end and just a new front end, just an AR interface. Just it like. is just another UX, isn't yeah. it, ultimately, right? In the end, knowing where stuff is stored in a warehouse, still, you know, it's a problem we currently tackle with like RFID chips and handhelds. And we could be turning that into a goggle experience because it's faster. Right. The bottom line is those technologies tend to take off where the cost of them is overwhelmed by the productivity boost. And at the consumer level, it's not there yet, but it is certainly in certain verticals and those things will continue to expand. 
And I'd love to say that that will be the end of app modernization, that we'll finally land at the final version, but you know, soon enough it'll be brain machine interfaces and then we'll yeah. just be... There is no final version. There's always continued modernization and apps only get old when we don't need them anymore. Right when we, the work the the work they need to do is becomes less and less relevant, gets shrunk down. We start rethinking workflows, and and we can retire software. That's not a bad thing either. Retiring software should be a party. It's like we got so good at solving this particular problem, we no longer have that dependency. Eh, it's not a bad solve either. Richard, thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. My pleasure, friend. Really, really useful. It's always great having you here. Enjoy your stay in Australia. Yeah, I'm gonna. I've got a little bit of time here now to uh, head up to the coast for a bit, and then I'm gonna hit, skip over to New Zealand to see the family. But it's great to get back here after you know three years away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. You bet. Yeah.